got Jasal Group. Rare coin. I already there did it, guys. Is. How you doing, man? I was already, I was already on it. <laughs> I'm good. How are you guys doing? Right, you guys. Okay. What's up, Aaron? How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Cool. Nice Sunday Thanks morning here in Chicago. Us. Yeah, Thanks yeah. Did, did did that snow finally let up, or is it still snowing out there? Uh, actually, it poured rain here all day yesterday. Nice. Oh, dude. If it's not one thing, it's another, right? Yeah, and today we've got 50 mile an hour gusts. So it's just, it's a mess right now. miles an hour. Jeez, yeah. man. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah, what, I've what got are you a, up to? I've got a couple to of, uh, I was with, uh, I was with my kids hanging out. Um, trying to think what we did. Oh, we we're just all over the place. Here, let me show you my, uh, this is, uh, that's the city. Wow. And that's Here, that's from the Harley J. Burke offices right there? No, that's from my bedroom. <laughs> nice. Dude. So you're in one of those high rises just outside. Yeah, of the that's soldier feet that's that's soldier field right there. Dude, that's and amazing. that's the lakefront behind it. Isn't that cool? Wow. Talk about yeah, prime pretty, real uh, estate. Yeah. Yeah. I got a good deal. I'm renting, but I'm getting a good deal here. So works out. And I'm only yeah, yeah. Uh, I, two I, miles I, from work. So how many? Two miles. Oh, that's not bad. That's pretty epic. So we just we want to yeah. say what's up to a few people on the feed. We have Jusal Group Rare Coins with us. We have my wife, Mrs. Lass. Uh, we have JCR Coin and Currency. What's up, man? Uh, we got Slab City Precious Metals. Slab City. Thanks for, thanks for being here, guys. We have Chell 1470. <coughs> um, glad to have you all with us. We've been working with Aaron for a little bit recently uh, because uh, Aaron has kind of headed up the Roundtable TV on Facebook, and that's how we got connected and found that we had a lot in common right off the bat as far yeah. as the kind of content we want to create for the industry, how we want to help out the coin market, how we want to move it forward. And, uh, and, and so it, it was really cool to connect with these guys. Um, I, I think we've got a good start here. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and then the, uh, the great American coin hunt too, which is, you know, coming up later this year, um, on the national coin week. What is that in April of this year? That's correct. Yeah. So, that's yeah, so we're right there. I mean, it's, it's, uh, is it coinciding with central States? The um, great American coin hunt? Probably around that time period, but uh, I think it's going to basically be, I think April itself is uh, National Coin Month in general, so it's just kind of, yeah. there'll be a starting point, but it's really that, from that point on, going forward. Oh, yeah. Um, Shell commented below, yeah, April 21st to 27th. Oh, yeah, that's it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the spot on the date there. Cool. <laughs> so, and I'm sure some people will be dropping after that as well, so just depending on what they, what kind of situation they have set up in their area. So um, everybody's got all kinds of different concepts there. Um, there is a website. I don't know if it's up yet. I'm pretty sure it is. That's being developed on different ways to uh, disperse the coins and what some of the ideas of that are people are doing across the country. So um, it's pretty exciting. So, yeah, and, and that's kind of an interesting point as far as dispersing the coins goes. Yeah. For this reason, some people are spending the coins. They're going right. to a gas station, they're going to a grocery store, whatever the case. They are actually circulating the coins. Some people are hiding them. Right. Can everybody hear my pug barking in the background? It's like super distracting. He sees something in the backyard he's really excited about. I'm going to go move him. And so He sounds like he's uh, he's got like an inner inner bark. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he does. He does. It sounds like he's barking in a closed room or something. This is Java the Pug, everybody. All right. See, there go, Mr. Pug. Java. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a little uh, he's a little two year old pug, but he's he's got tons of energy. Yeah, so wow. yesterday I actually went went to the um, the West Coast Collectibles uh, sports card and comic book show. It was in Pomona and uh, I met the guys over at SGC, which is Sports Card Grading Corporation. Interestingly enough, they're based in Florida. But they have no affiliation with NGC, which to me was just kind of interesting because they're, they're, they they kind of have that similar 
type of, of, of name uh, and logo as NGC, but they have no affiliation. My guess is, is that these guys want to be acquired by NGC at some point in time. They're, they're around the corner from them. Anyway, so here's one of the cards they gave me. It was a, a Magic Johnson certified. Uh, it's graded nine. You can see the logo up top. If you can see it, I'm not sure how clear it is, but the SGC logo. But yeah, it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah very little, cool. Little certified sports card of the Magic Man. <laughs> so just figured I'd share that with you guys. So, uh, Aaron, cool. do you know of anybody that has taken video of them dispersing the coins for Great American Coin Hunt yet? No, not at all. And um, I know, like, for my company, um, what we're going to do is I send out um, around 2,500 to 3,000 catalogs of our ancient coins and world coin and antiquity catalogs. Mm -hmm. And we, um, and that's all over the world, but I've got probably out of that, there's probably 2000 of those are domestic um, across the country. And what we're thinking of doing is just adding a couple of coins, a little packet into each catalog with right. information on the coin hunt and having each one of those individuals disperse those coins in those areas. That'll give us a big widespread Oh yeah. Um, push instead of just us just going to different stores and trying to disperse them that way. Why not get coin collectors that are already into the hobby um, helping out um, the best that they can. So oh, the, okay. to me, that made the most sense to do that. And I already have the distribution for it and I already have the catalogs going out. So adding a couple extra ounces yeah. isn't a big deal. That makes so, a lot of sense, man. It makes a lot of, it's, yeah. it's actually a really cool concept too. A really good idea. And I think it's going to make people feel a little more involved in the process. And it's just, yeah. it's a great way to bring people in. That's exciting. Really exciting. Yeah, I mean, totally. you know, I mean, ultimately, yes, we want people to find coins <clears throat> in their change. That'd be great. Um, and there's going to be all kinds of ways for us to make that happen. But also, we just want to make sure that the hobby grows and we get yeah. more and more people interested in it. And if that means that a coin collector that I have of ancient coins gets some modern coins, modern US, and they decide to give them to their, you know, their nieces or nephews or whatever the case might be, to me, that's just as positive in this whole thing. Oh, um, and that's also gonna grow the industry um, in ways that we're looking to do. Um, we're trying to get excitement for the industry um, as well as grow the industry. Um, and I think another way of doing it, we've been talking about working the regional shows a little bit more. Um, the problem is a lot of the big shows, you know, one of my employees brought this to my attention. He's absolutely correct. If you go to like the ANA or Long Beach, or we're going to um, the uh, Baltimore show next week, um, these are massive shows. And by the time the weekend comes around, everybody's gone. Anybody right. who's important is gone. And, oh, um, sure, sure. and anybody who is starting out collecting or, um, yeah, anyone who's starting out collecting either can't get off during the week because they're working nine to five or, um, you know, uh, you know, or they, or they have kids that they want to bring. So kids can't usually get off during the week. So those right. Wednesday, Thursday shows, Friday shows, people can't show up to. So, and if they do show up to them, I've been told a lot of the larger dealers don't give them the time of day because they consider them to be tire kickers and they're <laughs> doing their, and they're, you know, we call a lot of times the dealers call Saturdays and Sundays. If they're a show over the weekend, they call it tire kicker days. Right. Um, and so, and if you walk around to some of the larger dealers, you know, they leave one guy at the table with some catalogs in their case and right. no material. So, you know, being a new collector or bringing kids to a show can be one of these larger shows. Um, I think we're not growing the industry at all in those scenarios. We're actually turning people off to collecting because no, if you're not, not a okay. if you're not a big time collector with a lot of money, you're going to end up going to that show and feeling like garbage. So, but if you go to your local show where it's the same people all the time, these little tiny regional shows. Um, where they'll bring their kids because they're usually over a weekend in some cases, and it's a lot of mostly lower end material. But what if we were able to um, show up to those shows, uh, you know, a couple larger dealers in those areas, and really start to work the industry and letting people know about the coin hunt and actually trying to grow our industry from that level 
where you got people showing up and wanting to be, you know, they're part-time coin dealers, basically. Right. No, um, Aaron, Aaron, I agree. I agree. And, and to me, you know, you know, fr you know, Friday and Saturday, Sunday, those should be days of growth. They shouldn't be looking at those as, 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 as days of trying to, to get more, to get more counter sales. They should be looking at right. those as days to develop and days to grow and days to nurture and, 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 and try to come up with more creative ways to bring the public in. You know, I mean, right. I, I, uh, Ryan and I were at the, uh, the Long Beach, this last Long Beach show, um, and over at the U.S. Mint booth, uh, they had these, like, um, almost like U.S. Mint comic book cartoon coloring things and stickers, you know, so when the kids went up, they were kind of given this little packet and these, and, these, and these little personalities of U.S. Mint figures and, and stuff like that to really kind of try to bring the kids in. And I'm like, this is great. We need more of that, of those types of things. You know, I mean, even the, you know, the Boy Scouts have a, a merit badge for coin collecting. And to me, these <coughs> events need to really embrace the Scouts and say, come on, guys, come to our events. We will set up some, some, some corresponding, you know, um, um, you know, education with you guys. Uh, to further develop the program that's what needs to be done right yeah i mean it, it just you know and i think even the boy scouts probably go to these local shows more than they would the bigger shows just because right. they're their backyard and if they want to get their merit badge for you know for coin collecting it's easier for them to go to a small little regional show that's in their backyard than to go to some massive show that most dealers aren't going to give them the time of day sure um sure. you know and the other problem is, is like the ana and some of these larger uh organizations you know we go to these shows and they're like tuesday through saturday and by the time friday rolls around everybody's ready to go home we're like yeah. exhausted you know and so right. to deal with like you know trying to grow the industry at the end of the week um with oh, many dealers that have already like you know i mean the clientele don't understand that you sitting there for 10 hours a day in a convention hall with no light and it's depressing actually and you're totally. sitting there and because of the internet you know a lot of people aren't traveling to shows as much as they used to you know so <clears throat> most of these big shows are just wholesale shows no, and I, I agree it's and a really, joke and, and Aaron the show promoters I think you yeah. do a much better job of of pricing and incentivizing to the dealers. I mean, I mean, what if they said, "Okay, yeah. guys, we're going to give you Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday as X amount, and, and Saturday and Sunday we will we will we will pay you to stay. We will give you forty percent off your Wednesday through Friday rate if you stick around on Saturday and Sunday the whole time um, and be there exhibiting to the public. I mean, I think they need to incentivize the dealers better." To, uh, to stick around or or have a, a Thursday or Friday start at um, four o'clock and go later into the evening instead of running during the day when most people can't get off work That's so smart. they're you know I mean a lot of people um, you know still those dealers even if it was free they wouldn't stay you know unfortunately because it's an extra day of hotel that's it's just you know there's more money involved than having to stay out of town that's why i think attacking them at the regional shows is really how we have to build our industry and a lot of you know like i know that there was a show uh, locally which i didn't make it which of course i didn't make it out to um but i was told by my guys um you know uh my u.s guys they were like well nobody goes to that show and i said well that's the problem and they said that one of the bigger dealers went and turned around and went home and he was from California. And I said, well, yeah, that means that there was no big dealers there for him to, you know, work good deals with. And so, you know, you end up with a lot of beginning dealers out there that, you know, are the same type that are really, frankly, the beginning of our industry, you know, new collectors and new dealers across oh, yeah. the country. And right. so they're really the only way to, to bring new people into the fold is because look the other problem is, is if when you show when you're a new collector or an, even a new dealer and you show up to a big show you are just so overwhelmed there's like no way you know i mean you you go in and you see you know 500 tables i mean where do you go you know right. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> really overwhelming every single table in the no. in the whole board no. floor so who, who how do you no. even pick which table you go up to well, and if I, you know, I was telling my guys, um, you know, because I, you know, at my company, we sell U.S. coins, world coins, currency, antiquities, ancient coins. So we have a lot of different departments with people doing different things. And I told a couple of the of my um, uh, my lower staff, you know, the, not the senior staff, but the, um, you know, the beginning staff, 
you know, hey, if you guys go out to that show and you bring some, you know, mid-range or lower price items, you probably can do really well and you'll probably create some new connections for yourself. Right. Because Absolutely. that's important for them as dealers because they're, you know, we just took on a new guy. He's got a great eye um, and he's hungry. And sitting in the store waiting for people to walk in the door is not how you do business anymore. Right. You know, um, you got to go to shows, you got to be on the internet, and you have to make connections for yourself. So I think that um, it's uh, definitely an incentive for a lot of these younger dealers to go to these shows, especially if they represent big companies, um, because they'll not only be doing themselves a favor as a, you know, growing themselves as a dealer, but also they'll be helping out their company and helping out the industry at the same time. Because, you know, if you go to these, a lot of these little shows, you get up mostly garbage. So what if you bought some nice things? Maybe you won't sell them, but at least then the dealers and these new collectors know that there's great material out there that they can actually hold and see and feel. That's great advice, man. It's great advice. Really. Absolutely. Because I don't know about you, but when I go to shows, I generally go around and see who's selling what and what kind of quantities people have in cases. When I go to Long Beach sometimes and I'm looking around in these cases and people literally have buckets of circulated coins, I'm like, what kind of impression is that creating for A, all the rest of the dealers in here, but B, the public <coughs> that may or may not be collecting and then go in there and think that's what coin collecting is? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a totally different perception. You know, we go to, if we go to a small show, we have what we call our junk bins. A lot of dealers have them especially if they're going to a regional show. It's just stuff that's accumulated, doesn't cost us a whole lot, and we try to dump it at these small shows. Um, if you take the same buckets to a big show, nobody looks through them because right. there's so many dealers there, and somebody just wrote, I can't walk through an entire show. Nobody right. Yeah. You know, so are you going to really stop? Kids. Right, I mean, so are you going to really stop at some somebody's bucket of $2 junk coins and spend an hour and a half going through them? No, but if you take them to a regional show, you probably sell out. So, you know, it right. just depends on what you're trying to go after. Um, and that's why shows have kept dying over the years. Um, that's why they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, the, in my opinion, you know, I haven't been to Long Beach in a long time, but the Whitman show is as big as some of the A&As now. Yeah. You know, an A&A used to be a massive show. It just not is anymore. And, you know, in ancient coins, um, the Europeans don't come over at all, except for the New York International. You get a couple of the germs that'll come for the ANA and a couple other shows, but really they only come over once a year now. And I don't blame them. Why would you want to come all the way to America, spend all the money and all the hotel and all that stuff and not sell anything or just right. do some wholesale business? It just doesn't make sense. So um, shows have just completely changed. And I don't think that um, the larger organizations and larger shows well, I, I can't say the shows, but really the large organizations have taken hold of that and learned that you're not going to build up the industry through these larger shows. you got to do it through grassroots programs. And that's why the Great American Coin Hunt is a grassroots program. This is what we're talking about. This is yeah. how we're going to grow our industry. We have to get dealers involved, collectors involved. we got to make it exciting. And it, it's not just, you know, one event like the, the Great American Coin uh, Hunt. It's everything that we're talking about here. You know, um, educating the public, uh, yeah. bringing people into the fold, um, seeing how we can reach out to the kids. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. You know, I mean, that's part of the reason, you know, um, we're doing this video contest on Roundtable TV. Right. You know, it's, it's to not only get collectors involved, but we've had, you know, I had a 13-year-old kid who found out he has a YouTube channel on coins. And it's that great. That's so awesome. You know, I saw so, that yesterday and I was like, yes, yeah. man, that's yeah, awesome. Exactly. That's pretty cool. So, you know, that's, that's what we want to see. And so how, how many of us have searched through YouTube and noticed that there's X amount of kids that have YouTube channels on coins, you know, yeah, right. and, yeah, um, yeah. and they actually have decent followings on top of it. So, yeah. I mean, these are, these are the future collectors and dealers of America, but they're not going to shows either, probably, you know, right. they're just kind of yeah. winging it, going through their coin, local coin stores, um, you know, it, it just, it, it's sad in a way. They're buying coins on Facebook. Um, they're, yep. they're buying coins on Instagram. <laughs> yep. So it's it, the marketplace true. is definitely changing. There's no okay. doubt. Yeah. Um, I think that's why some of the things that Roundtable is doing are, are is so important in, in sort right. of funneling the attention or getting people to congregate around some similar ideas. Uh, and I, I just want to take a minute to talk about the video contest you have going sure. on 
uh, for Roundtable because that's that's one of those aspects where we're kind of getting people to participate yeah. in a central location. And what I'm most excited about is a lot of these guys that are submitting these videos are doing so for the first time. They're saying, hey, I've never made a video before. Here's my first try. And a lot right. of them have actually been really good. <coughs> And, and classic kid, I see your comment down there. Um, I thought about starting a YouTube channel before. You know what? Make a Go video. It. So, submit it to uh, to the Roundtable TV contest on Facebook. On Go Facebook, it. now's your chance. I mean, I mean, put something. You can also there. share it. You can also share it on the YouTube channel too. Because if I get them there, I can just, um, you know, paste a link to Facebook. It's the same awesome, thing. Man. You know, and, as long as we Aaron, can view it, Aaron that's fine. Up, uh, I think what a thousand dollars of your own money, cash. Uh, yeah, well, now we're, we're, we now decided to have uh, uh, Roundtable cover that. <laughs> so, oh, nice. so that's, that's nice. fine. But, um, but, but you yeah, it's uh, probably You were going to put it up I whether Roundtable did or not. So respect, man. I was. Um, I was. I, I thought that was really cool. Uh, well, but... I have a tendency to want to make things happen, and I don't want to wait on politics, and not that um, – me or the guys at Roundtable have any negative politics, but I didn't want to create any just in case. Sure, so, sure. but luckily they they you know um, you know Rob uh, Obreth, who I work with very closely and who's a great guy and good friend, uh, he basically came to me. And he's like, "You're not paying for that." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair so, enough. The, so, so there's 10, 10 places, right? The first place yeah. uh, is a four hundred and fifty dollar cash prize. It's uh, five hundred for first for place. First. 250 yeah. per second? Yeah. And, 150 and so, for third. And then I was going to pay $50 out from fourth to tenth. So, so all, you, you know, all you guys have to do is make a video, and there's a yeah. really good chance you could be totally. walking away with some cash in your hand. There's no reason right. not to spend three to seven minutes making a video right. real quick. So make your video today. Yeah. Jump on Facebook and go ahead and send Aaron a message or Roundtable TV a message. Or you guys. That video in. Yeah. It's, or you guys. It's a great idea. You know. Do, uh, I, I don't you know, know how it, much time you have, Aaron, but do you want to talk about Artified a yeah. little bit? Sure. Why not? Okay. I got plenty of time. My kids yeah. are in the other room. I told them not to bother me. So they're they're, <laughs> they're sitting there with their iPad or they're on um, like PUBG or Fortnite. Or they're on. Right? snapchat and everything yeah. else so <laughs> yeah um, the, the things that kids you know, do nowadays yeah yeah so we thought, but they're not we thought, they're not barking or howling at the moon so they're that's good, good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah so we when we first heard about artified it was several months ago uh when john initially yeah. got in touch with you and we thought it was yeah. such a cool idea uh the the way that you have a, a collaborative um way that people can authenticate items isn't that kind of how it started well, I, I, what I wanted to do is create crowd vetting um, okay. because I, I feel like um, uh, without, you know, getting myself in trouble, um, you know, the slabbing companies do a righteous job at what they do, but sure. I think that there, we all can agree that there's problems with it. There's oh, problems yeah. with the system and we dealers know what the problems are, but we don't really have any way to solve it. And I felt that the best way to solve it, you've got, look, you've got CAC which is basically a vet. You know, John Alvin has put his name cool. behind it, but it's just a vet, that's all it is. Um, Eagle Eye, it's a vet. You know, I mean, these are just, too, yeah. Act, yeah, these are just extra um, uh, feel good comments for the item that you're trying to buy or sell, right? And that, and depending on who puts their sticker on it, it's gonna add a certain amount of value or uh, more saleability to the piece. So imagine going to a website and looking up that piece and seeing a thousand or five thousand comments about the same piece that's embedded in blockchain technology. Um, that's kind of where I was going with it. Um, I felt that blockchain technology um, was uh, had some some great points that we could use for the coin industry and collecting in general. Um, uh, everybody gets scared with blockchain because they think of Bitcoin and they think of Ethereum and they think of, oh, I just lost my butt on this stuff. Um, but it isn't about the cryptocurrency. It's about if you take the, all the cryptocurrency and you move it to the side, you move that curtain aside, there's all kinds of amazing technology that makes it possible called blockchain technology. And if you studied it and you understand it a little bit, um, you'll know that the crypto is just a residual of blockchain technology. 
And so right. you can use blockchain technology and that same technology to create um, a, uh, a register and actually embed code that is um, that is not, um, that's the word I'm looking for. It's not breakable. It's not editable. It's, it's, it's not editable. editable. It's also, right. uh, it's it's impossible to crack as well. Now maybe right. it'll get cracked somewhere down the future with artificial intelligence or something like that, but that's for the future. So, um, so I felt that if I could create a type of vetting process uh, using blockchain technology for coins, antiquities and collectibles, um, that I would be doing a service for the industry as well as um, uh, creating pedigree lines as well because with ancient coins, pedigree is so important. It's not so important with US coins, depending on what it is. Unless um, with it's like ancient, Elias Bird or something. Right, or but with ancient coins, whatever. Ev yeah, with ancient coins, because of all the restrictions that we're going through right now, um, we cannot import certain coins into the US uh, based on specific restrictions at CPAC, which is a committee that it, frankly has been stacked with archeologists um, that are against collecting. And so they give oh, the State weird. Department and customs the right to create laws of what we as Americans can import into this country. That's crazy. So of course, the first thing that passed was the Italian restriction in, in the year 2000. It was in fact the last thing that uh, Bill Clinton signed before he left office. And it was mainly for antiquities and they were able to, we were able to lobby to keep coins off of it. They've now, it comes up every five years. So they've now put coins on it. So now that they did with um, Italian coins, as they said, we were able to keep it to just being indigenous to the region during a certain time point. So that's Roman Republican coinage. So once the Roman right. Empire expanded, then it's impossible to know who owns something because if the Roman Empire contro controlled Spain and, or France, which was Londonum, and it was minted there in ancient times, who owns it? Does France own it? Because that's where it was minted. Does Roma own it? Because they own the whole world. Right, or right. maybe it was maybe it was uh, actually found in Germany. Does Germany own it now? Because that's where it was found. Right. So it's impossible to know who owns these things. And because ancient coins traveled, they were mass produced. You cannot really put them on the same point as antiquities, which are mostly um, though some did travel. Most of them are indigenous, and, uh, and also you cannot um, you can't decipher between a base and a facade of a building. They're both antiquity. So right. it's really impossible at that point. So because of all these restrictions, it's very important to have pedigree. So anything that's before 1970 uh, is part of the UNESCO treaty. And that means that museums and universities can purchase, right? So um, that means that all governments for the most part where these source countries, where these coins came from, it's off limits if it's before 1970 in general, even though some of that has been being even been challenged by the Italians and the Turks and other things like that. So but now, because of that, Aaron, is that coin dealers that are lobbying to try to get their coins to stay in their local region and and keep the US <clears throat> from getting access to them? It, well, it, it really is just about uh, the revolving door right into the into the US. So it's really just about what coins can come in here. Once coins are here, they're legal. There's you can buy and sell and export them all you want. It's right. just about what can come back into the country. So now if I have a Roman Republican coin that I want to import in that is on the restriction, if it doesn't have a pre whatever it is, 2005 or 2004 date, it can't come into the US anymore. So oh, wow. um, so that's it's changed that's the game crazy. so that and also certain coins and even artifacts, if they have a early pedigree, if especially if it's pre-1970, I can add double, triple, quadruple the retail price because that's what wow. they're bringing out. And part that's of that is because, crazy, man. I know, part of that, and it's more with antiquities than it is for coins. Coins, I think it does increase the value, but then maybe not double or triple. But a lot of these coins, whether it's U.S. coins, world coins, ancient coins, they're all going, everything's going to auction these days. And that's another problem with our industry right now, right? Because now we have small businesses that aren't surviving anymore. And that's why we don't have storefronts anymore because, right. um, because everything's going to auctions now. And yeah. um, the, the internet is kind of the modern storefront. I mean, well, it, people don't the want to leave their but, homes. Yeah, it's the internet, but it's also the auctions. So the auctions have now created, and look, now nobody has any problem spending 20% commission or more 
uh, on buyer's fees. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I when I started in the business, it was standard 15 percent. And that right. would and we felt that was a lot. And there right. was people that were offering zero still, you know, um, and now you can in some cases, Heritage will offer over 100 percent to the seller. So right. it's a huge incentive um, to get things to auction. And, and, and them raising their fees doesn't seem to have impacted no. their sales. They went up to 17 and a half percent, kept growing. Now they're at 20 percent. They keep growing. So right. Um, and that's just for coins. Right. It's, I'm right. sure for for artifacts or not artifacts, but antiques and things like that, they're at 22, 23, 25, because that's oh, what yeah. uh, Sotheby's and Christie's are and people like that. So um, but so now you've got the upper one or two percent fighting over the best quality items and the best pedigrees. And these things are bringing huge prices, right? So what do you, now I'm just talking about ancient coins and antiquities. So what do you think happens now if you're in one of these um, source countries and you're a scumbag smuggler and you see that a coin you just found brought uh, $50,000, you know, right. they, they're, it's more incentive for them to steal. So it's a huge, huge, huge problem. And I could go off forever about this. But wow. the point is, is that with blockchain technology, we can tie in some of the pedigrees because if I have a coin that I know came from grandma's collection and I know it's legit because us as dealers are pretty good at reading people. Generally, we've seen enough BSers in our lives yeah. to know who's BSing and who's not. Yeah. And but if there's no pedigree, because guess what? Nobody cared about keeping receipts back in the 60s or 70s or even 80s. Right. And so, I mean, these are the days of walking onto a plane and smoking and, you know, all this stuff, you know, nobody, nobody gave a crap, you yeah. know, so none of that stuff is, 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 has been kept. And, and, and also, and I'm sure you guys have seen this too, husbands, which is primarily, it's a male dominated field, uh, not only dealers, but collectors, we're hoping to change that with round table. We got to work on that. Yep. We're trying to work on that, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, they're hiding what they buy from their wives. You know, and so they don't right. want their wives to see the invoices, so they throw them out. Oh, you know, yeah. and so, so some guys yeah. will even tell us, "Don't send me an invoice if my wife right. sees this. I'm They'll in freak trouble. Out. I'll be sleeping on the couch." Exactly. So now, as a dealer, we get those coins, and unless you're lucky enough to find it in an auction, which sometimes we're able to do, and that's a that's a great incentive for us. But most of the time, you can't. And guess what happens if? Um, you know, uh, um, a um, archaeologist would say, well, you don't have paperwork. It was just looted yesterday. You know, right. it's on the same playing field as that. Right. So now if we were able to keep a record online of the pedigree and the movement of ownership between one person and another and time stamping it, that's going to be a huge advantage for us in the future for being able to keep this material flowing through okay. um, the collector base right. as well as adding value over time well and, and that could help potentially thwart thievery in the future um yeah. say say the community was able to authenticate something and keep a record of it uh with in in the blockchain uh then went to sell that coin later and it and it was stolen you'd have that right. immutable record um so right. that man artified has such huge potential what is the kind of the next step for it? Are, are people able to use it already or is it still in development? It's just a, it's just a white paper at this point, just a concept. Okay. Um, you know, uh, so <clears throat> I started it last year with a good tech friend of mine and we were trying to get investors and we actually went to a, a, the biggest blockchain conference that they ever had in New York um, this past year. Um, and it was, I mean, just to get in the door, it was $2,000 a ticket. I mean, it was, Good crazy. Lord, for a consumer yeah. or for a um, an exhibitor? Uh, anybody who wanted to show up. You couldn't get in the door without wow. $2,000 a ticket. And they sold Damn, the entire- That's really restrictive. They, they collected like something like $25 million. Wow. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude, that's, that's crazy. That, yeah. So now imagine, Good imagine Lord. now you're, imagine now you're with 10,000 people um, which are the greatest minds all across the world, all with concepts and ideas, and they're all looking to get funding. Guess what? <laughs> you're just in, you're just in a sea. You know, it doesn't oh, mean yeah. anything. I mean, I've been to some of those. Uh, not <clears throat> right. not that specifically. Uh, I was sent by one company to to represent them. 
uh, well, I'll just say it. It was Monaco sent me to represent them at um, at the Money Show, which is the same kind of thing. It's an investor conference, but you go onto that exhibitor hall and you're competing with the hottest marijuana companies, the the hottest tech companies, oil and I mean, gas, pharmaceuticals, the yeah, next Facebook. Everyone. You know, I mean, like which they're all backed with VC money. And they've oh, got man. millions and millions and millions of dollars behind them. And, you know, so, um, so then I came back to the drawing board and I was like, well, we got to try to get people interested in our project. And so one of the ways we thought would, we would try to do it was through gaming. So I created a numismatic game for, um, Apple, um, wow. and a web version as well. <clears throat> and it's pretty much finished. I just have to probably, probably put another $5,000 into it or so. Um, but basically what it does is that I've got a working version on my own. So what it does is um, it brings up a picture of a coin and asks you questions and then you answer them. And if you get the question right, then you um, win points. And we were going to try to turn those points into uh, our token, which then they eventually would be able to purchase coins and movie tickets and other things online with. Um, we thought that would be a great way to get kids involved because, uh, and or adults, because everybody in the coin industry is always looking to learn. And oh, yeah. so the best way to learn is to actually see a picture of a coin and then, you know, have a tie to memory with some, you know, key points to it. Yeah. Um, and so I've got like ancient coins where I could say there's a test or a quiz for mythology. And so I have Greek coins that are coming up or Roman reverse coins that are coming up with different myths. And then I give the, you know, who do you think this is or whatever the situation is that's cool um and so you can do it on mythology you can do it all i mean there's all kinds of things you can do with quizzes um and i thought we could crowdsource it as well so that was kind of the direction i went but then i stopped and now i'm more involved with roundtable and so we're trying to think of ways of getting blockchain involved with roundtable if we want to go that route um but it's a it's a slippery slope because a lot of people are afraid of blockchain because they can only think of bitcoin they can't yeah, get right, 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 right. the Bitcoin thing. Ah. So, right, exactly. Well, no, so it, it's a good way to, to have a ledger and accountability, but also have some yeah. anonymity as well, where there's some right. privacy along with that. So yeah, it's right. it, 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 it's it, it's a good fit. And in the blockchain in the blockchain community, unless you have an MVP, nobody wants to talk to you. Right. They want you to build the whole thing. So, right. and then that, then they'll come in and, and sweep you up and take you to new plateaus, I guess. But, right. you know, I, I, it's a joke to me because I, see, I'm also starting from the other direction. Most blockchain companies, they start, their tech guys don't know anything about the industries that they're creating blockchain for. And then they try to get it adopted into those, um, right. into right. those industries where I'm already in depth into the industry and I'm trying to go the other direction. And I can't right. get anybody to like jump on board, but, um, you know, so it's kind of at the moment, it's kind of, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's just kind of sitting there right now. And I'm just waiting for the right possibility, the right investors, the right connections, um, to come along and work together. I, I wasn't my whole intention with any of this stuff, whether it's round table or artified, it's not to make millions of dollars. I think that that comes if it comes, you know? My, my whole point is, is that I want to make our industry better. And if I create some great connections for myself, that's going to help me make sales and create better business All for me it. anyway. All those residuals right. do good things for me, right? So it's not about making money just on that specific project. It's about creating projects that are going to make our industry better, which then makes me better, which makes the industry stronger. Yeah, so those, oh, that's if what it all is about. If you're serving a purpose and you're solving a need, then I agree. It's a, the, the, the rest right. of it is going to come along with it. I mean, even Roundtable, you know, I don't, I don't make a penny off Roundtable, and I bust my butt on Roundtable. You do, and to, you and it's out. not, yeah. To me, it's not about making money. If I make money down the road, great, you know. But I also want to make the industry, and I want to make Roundtable wonderful because I'm kind of sick and tired of the organizations not doing anything, and right. I feel like Roundtable is is one of the best organizations that I've ever been a part of, and that is can make change and make change quickly and it's all built organically on facebook and it's all the younger dealers um the beginning you know it's the next generation of dealers right. so you know the old guys there are some old guys on there that have been on there for a long time um that are on round table and that and we need their advice and their help like as well Mike Klein. 
Yeah, sure. Um, any of these guys. guys like um, that, yeah. I mean, Jeff Garrett, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, you know, I mean, no bigger name in the business than that. That's so, <clears throat> so he's a legend. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with good reason. So, but, um, you know, I feel like there's too much politics involved in some of the organizations and nothing ever gets finished. And there's a lot of money that's been built up in those organizations and they're not spending it wisely either. Yep. And they haven't been spending it wisely for a long time. Right. Um, I, and what, I, what really took me with Roundtable is that when um, somebody had a problem, I don't know, somebody was dying of cancer. I don't remember what the situation was. And in one weekend we raised $20,000 for the family just wow. through the round table matters. Just, you know, just pushing it and saying, hey, give some money, help the family out. Somebody else, there's a, a woman on there who um, was complaining she was having trouble with her bills. We raised five grand for her. You know, I mean, awesome. it's just, that's really what round table is about for me. Um, and I'm also an, I obviously probably haven't figured it out by now, I'm an idea guy. Big time. Um, and so um, round table gives me the ability to work with Rob and other guys in round table to, implement new ideas for our industry, which is um, in dire need. So, oh, absolutely. Um, so I, I love it all. I think it's great. You know, it's time consuming, but it's, but it's, um, I like the action. I, I mean, the truth is the future of the industry is up to us because yes. the, a lot of the guys that, that have been at the top of the industry for the last couple of decades are getting really old. Some of them are retiring. Some of them are yeah. closing down their shops. So, I mean, we're at that point, we're all, in our you know 30s and 40s here so we're going to kind of be that next generation and so it's up to us to make the industry uh the way that we see it best serving the public and and ourselves uh and and so it, we're really excited to be part of this group i think um we're going to do some great things together and oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I i love where this is going right now yeah, I mean, it's you're you hit it on the head. You know, I mean, we're, we're all in the same boat, and if we work together collectively, we can do some really wonderful things. If we work against each other, which is what has always happened in the industry, because I always oh, yeah. found that a lot of times there's a lot of backstabbing in the industry. Oh, um, it's crazy. And it's, it's and it gets ugly, and really, it's not doing anybody any good. Okay, when when the when the um, when the industry was gangbusters and everybody was fighting over everything. Um, and there was lots of money around, I could kind of understand it a little bit, but I think that we got to get past that. And we have to realize that, look, the average age of an ANA member is 65 and older. Right. So, um, so right that- the future, yeah. Right, and that means two things. That either means that there's not enough ANA members that are joining that are young, which means that as a whole, the organization is dying, um, and or there's just not enough new, uh, collectors and, and dealers um, in the industry. So I, I think it's I think a little it's bit of both. Things. And then I think yeah. if I were a young collector and I was on Facebook buying from silver miners or stackers or any of those groups and they kind of have their own uh, community policing, uh, I would I would be saying to myself, what's in it for me to join this organization when I have to pay, you know, $80 or $100 a year? I, I don't I don't know what the like individual. I think the lowest is. is like 25 bucks or something, oh, okay. but yeah. it might be more than that. Um, but it's not expensive. In fact, uh, Slab City just asked and, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's not expensive. Just go to their site. Um, but, yeah. you know, but Whatever also the case, uh, they may be they may be looking at that and going, OK, we have this community already that kind of does all the things that I may want that organization to help protect me from or provide me with information or whatever they may want right. an ANA for. So they're asking themselves, why would I pay the fee? Right, right. I and mean, we're trying to change some of that too. Um, Rob uh, is actually running for governor. He was asked to run for governor for a and Oh yeah, and he's so, got my vote. Um, so he's got mine as well. So um, my sister, uh, Shanna, is also in the industry. She's an ancient coin dealer and she's also running for governor as well. Um, so, you know, we're getting some younger people, women, um, involved in ANA and whether or not they can make some changes. I mean, the advantage with Rob being on there is that he's got a thousand, a thousand dealers behind him, you know, right, right. that can make some change. So what he has to say, even though he's, it would be a new guy, a new face in the, in the, um, space, um, his voice would have a huge amount of weight in my opinion, oh, yeah. because it'd be silly to denounce or say something against what he has to say, just the fact that he has that much 
that many people or followers behind him that are willing to, uh, you know, to stick up for him and actually follow him. So exactly. Um, yeah. So awesome, man. yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to work with you guys as well. Yeah, um, I think that you know we we both realized that we we're kind of on the similar path, and um, and so it made sense to work together than to work against each other. Absolutely. Um, and again, that's all about what we're talking about right now. We're all talking about working together and doing the right things. That's why I whenever you know um, my forte is ancient coins and antiquities, so a lot of people don't know about that stuff. I get tons and tons of questions every day on Facebook um, from dealers. Um, and collectors, but mostly dealers. And right. I have no problem helping them out. It doesn't cost me, I don't make a dime off of it, but who knows? I mean, you can't quantify everything. You know, one of these guys might get a good deal or a big client someday and they'll buy a coin from me. So that's the advantage. And at the mm -hmm. same time, I'm also helping grow ancient coins because a lot of these guys don't know ancient coins. They don't feel comfortable. And so if they have somebody to pick their, help pick the brain of uh, and help make the right decisions so they don't lose their butt, then that's also a positive too. So again, just going back to that, we, if we all work together as a collective right. whole, we're gonna do much better. Absolutely. Yeah, this, this generation I think can be better than the generation before. Uh, yeah. I think if more people adopt that attitude, it's just gonna benefit everybody. And um, I, you know, I, I think we can get that done. I think with the, you know, the right promotion, the right encouragement, the right attitude about this, it's it's within our grasp, and yeah. and that's that's the way I see things playing out. You know, it's all it's all built on social media. That's where a lot of this is going on right now, and um, and so the larger organizations um, aren't really attacking that in the same way, and that's why it's to uh, it's really to our advantage because um, the the other beautiful thing about the coin industry is that because it's a small industry in general, we can all make big changes um, collectively uh, very fast. And um, and that's you can't really do that in all industries. And I, just just and real a, quick, that's a for, beautiful thing. For Slab City Precious Metals, um, looks like you want to learn about ancient coins. I would find Harlan J. Burke Numismatics or Aaron Burke on Facebook, uh, and also Roundtable TV. Aaron posts a ton about ancient coins, and and I'm a U.S. expert. I've, that's where I've spent 15 years in my career in daily study. I don't know that much about ancients, and I have learned a ton uh, watching Aaron's videos, watching Aaron's flat posts. A, a lot of the stuff that he that he yeah. puts on there is very usable, practical information, uh, and I think it it give you a wealth of knowledge if if you went to his Facebook pages. Yeah, also yeah, actually on just, LinkedIn as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, Aaron's really yeah, good on LinkedIn too. I I um I also just um implemented because I realized, and this is kind of how how things new ideas develop you know so i started doing the you know putting a video of, of an ancient coin and flipping it you know on facebook and on instagram and things like that and on uh, youtube and um <clears throat> and i realized that photos only tell half the story and if the photo isn't great it's going to tell less of the story and so now i implemented a system with my own website where i have a video of every single ancient coin but that's where we're starting now so our new list has now all video of every coin, um, whether it's a hundred dollars or it's ten thousand dollars. It doesn't matter, the, right. and it's and to me that um, it's not only teaching. I mean, you don't have to buy a ten thousand dollar coin to view it, view the image, and learn something. See what luster looks like. See what the edge of the coin looks like. I'm sorry if you have a whole if you hold a slab in your hand. You're not going to learn the same things, but right. you can actually right. visually see the edge and the surface and the luster um on my videos and i'm hoping other people in the industry kind of follow that suit as well because i think it'll help teach a lot it actually can show you what a fake might look like if there's a fake there um so these are the kinds of things that are born through social media and through some of these ideas that we implement on social media they can exactly. actually become reality in real life and so i think it's uh it's exciting it so, really is yeah awesome. yeah it's awesome to see where this is going well, thanks for taking a little bit of your family time with us today. I know you got the kids today. Sure. Um, yeah. but we always enjoy talking to you and, and kind of these um, like theoretical discussions we have and, and, and kind of where we see the industry going. It, it's always cool to kind of jam on that with you. Um, yeah. So really appreciate you jumping in with us live. I, I hope we can do this every once in a while and, and kind yeah, of awesome. um, get really hands on uh, with our communities here. 
Um, yeah, you, you know I don't mind talking, so it's okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I don't think any of us do. <laughs> no. no. Right, it's so yeah. funny, you know, when I did the, just one last thing, when I, you know, people, yeah. if you're afraid of making videos for the video contest or just creating a YouTube channel or whatever, you know, you're holding a phone in front of your face or your, or your camera on your computer. You just have to forget anybody's there. It's not like standing in front of a crowd. You're not going to get the same kind of stage fright. And once you start talking, it's not a big deal. And half the time when I do videos with my staff members, they're terrified. And then when it's done, I'm like, was it that bad? And they're like, no. And <laughs> you it's like, what? so, it's, you know. The, the truth is I understand where people are coming from. I right. struggled with it actually for months. And yeah. I'm an outgoing person. I do great public speaking. Uh, I've, I've kind of always been that way. But for some reason, when it came to putting myself on video, to start talking about what I know about coins, it took me a long time. John and I- I'm a shy guy. Months. I'm a shy yeah. guy. I don't, if you if you find me at a party, I'm the one who doesn't talk. So- Seriously? Um, it's just how I am. Yeah. Really? It's how I am. Oh, yeah. I never would've got that. Yeah, I'm just, a, you know, but you know, but I love, I love what I do for a living and I love sharing what we have. And so it's pushed me to um, create a different, uh, I don't know, um, different, uh, different outlook side of yourself. myself. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, it's helped me grow. Wow. It helped, it's actually helped me grow as a person, believe it or not. So you have to look at the positive. I'm actually a very humble person. And so, um, it, you have to kind of put your humility aside and jump in full on if you want to get anywhere in life. Um, exactly. but you can still have humility and do it properly without, um, without, uh, endangering your personality or, or, or who you are as a person right yeah. exactly so if so if you're out there and you're thinking about creating a video and, and maybe you've been struggling with with the idea a little bit you kind of can't get over the hump just do one and see how it goes do your first one today give it a shot try yeah. it out i guarantee you it you will be better when the video is over than when you started 100 cheryl said cheryl says you can learn so much by observing others when at parties I totally agree. I love people watching. <laughs> yeah. It's so much fun. It's the so, best. Then yeah. you don't have to worry about the one that everybody's looking at. <laughs> yeah. No, so. I'm, I'm a people watcher too. I get it. But I, yeah. I also like to participate. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a little exactly. bit of both. Yeah, you yeah. have to party a little bit exactly. myself too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially after that. Well, it's been great, spring. guys. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. You, give, you give John the same. one craft beer, <laughs> and, and uh, he's giggling like a little schoolgirl within minutes. The rest of the night, awesome. <laughs> That's it. I'm a cheap date. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, my inhibition. Well, thanks again for joining us, man. All right, Aaron. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Have a nice Sunday. All right, we'll see you soon.